Question of the week. Who here has already started your daily regimen of watching Hallmark Christmas movies? Anybody? We've got one hand, at least a few honest people. Thank you so much, Dalton, for being willing to admit that. <laughs> I, for one, love a good Hallmark Christmas movie, and here's the reason why. They are so predictable. I went online and I looked at the recent catalog of all the Hallmark Christmas movies that had been made for just this season. Some 30 in number. Here's the synopsis of one Hallmark Christmas movie entitled About a Cheerful Christmas. Has anybody seen that one? Lauren and her best friend Colleen think that they have landed their dream job giving people the best and most magical Christmas ever as their personal Christmas coaches. This holiday season promises to be their biggest ever when they land a royal client, the Anderson family, who has moved from England. When Lauren meets James, the eldest son, he wants nothing to do with planning Christmas as he's busy negotiating a big acquisition for his father's company. But Lauren won't be thwarted in helping this royal family embrace the true spirit of Christmas. The more she prods James about their family holiday traditions, the more he opens up. Sparks start to fly. But she faces competition in the form of an old childhood friend and business colleague of James. Now... Lauren must win his heart while giving the Andersons their best Christmas ever, starring Erica Deutschman and Chad Connell. I want to go out on a limb here and say that in some way, this movie ends with both Lauren and James having the perfect Christmas kiss in the town square as the snow gently begins to fall on their beautiful, radiant faces. And all of us, having seen this and lived into this beautiful Hallmark Christmas moment, will feel something that we believe to be joy. But is that joy? Is that the real joy that endures the test of time? That bedrock of following Jesus wherein no matter if your Christmas season is merry and bright or it is a blue, blue Christmas, you know deep down within there is a strength that abides, a hope that will never give up, and a peace which knows no end. Our meditation today, listed atop your order of worship, says the following. Please open up as I read it aloud. Joy because of grace is never ending, constantly evolving, and ever present in our walking. Now, just to know that my people are with me, let's read that together aloud. Joy because of grace is never ending, constantly evolving and ever-present in our walking. Here's the synopsis of my sermon, just like the one I gave you for the Hallmark Christmas movie. If you want a joy that is everlasting, you must encounter the grace of God. Now, many people turn and address grace much like National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Grace, she died 40 years ago. <laughs> we talk about grace. We think we understand grace, but the question is, have you encountered grace? That moment when you received something that you did not deserve, and because of that, you experienced a joy unparalleled. I think that's the heart of the scripture which was read to us today out of the chapter of Matthew. We have these kings of the Orient 
magi, wise men. Some traditions say three, in likeness to three gifts given. Others say it was a large caravan of many who traveled from afar. But what we know is that these people were individuals not of Jewish descent, like that recitative that our Dr. Larry Frazier sang to us so beautifully from the Messiah. They were the Gentiles that had now seen the light. And the reason that they saw the light is because they studied the night sky. They practiced astrology, believing that the destiny of a man was determined under the star which he was born. And they studied the night sky intensely in this season of the world's history because many scholars believe that overarching in the civilized world, there was the belief of an imminent messianic announcement. People far and wide believed that there would be a ruler of all rulers who would be born and he would set all the captives free. One Roman poet, Virgil, actually noted that he believed this savior of the world was to be none other than Caesar Augustus. He who is credited in Luke as calling everyone to account so that they could be registered in their hometown and therefore taxed. Another Roman historian, Sustonius, writes, there had spread over all the Orient an old established belief that it was fated at that time for men coming from Judea to rule the world. You see, it's not just by happenstance that kings of Persia were watching the night sky and saw some heavenly phenomenon that drew them ultimately to Judea. It was the culmination of a movement within history wherein they saw that through the stars, the fulfillment of that moment, but moreover, the fulfillment of the longing of every human heart for ultimate truth would be fulfilled when they arrived at the point where this star shone its brightest. We think that it was just the star shining down on some particular scene in Bethlehem, perhaps then in a house where boy Jesus and his family resided, but I'd like to offer a different illustration. It was not just that a heavenly orb shone down upon a house and a person in Bethlehem. It is that that person had a light all its own, which radiated for all to see. He was Jesus. As our Advent theme states, he was the light of the world. A light that shone in the darkness, and the darkness had not overcome it. The wise men, undeterred by schemes put in place by a murderous king known as Herod, undeterred by people that were Herod's scribes and teachers who knew the scripture but did not seek the truth of the scripture, the wise men went forward still, not having a Jewish heritage of their own, but believing that somehow they not only saw a sign, that, but in their hearts they had the faith to believe that that sign was from a God of love and that in their courage to follow that sign, they would find a joy which is unspeakable. In our scripture, I want to give specific attention to verses 9 through 11. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. 
Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The Greek word that is used to later describe the English translation of overjoyed is quite curious and I believe holds an answer and a truth for all of us today and perhaps especially those who feel like your joy is diminished or perhaps all but disappeared. The actual Greek translation leads us to understand that the grace that they had received in that moment was in fact the reason of their joy, translated specifically as rejoice because of grace or joy because of grace. In that moment, as Gentile kings of Persia not only came into the presence of Jesus Christ, but were received and accepted into the very presence of God, they realized something very important, that though they lived a life wherein they tried to read the stars and discern truth, they now encountered a God who proclaimed himself the truth, the light, and the way. He was there in the flesh, no longer a mystery to try to find, but now a reality to embrace. Grace personified before them, in their very eyes, and in that moment, the reason why I believe the wise men, however many they were, were rejoicing is because they encountered grace. Now, here's one thing I know about grace. Once you receive it, you're never again the same And so wise men who traveled perhaps weeks, perhaps months, did something out of joy that was not in line with their tradition. They worshiped not the stars, but they worshiped God in the flesh. It says in the text that not only did they bow down, prostrate in worship to Jesus, but they offered him. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, represented of all the ways in which grace was to be personified in Jesus Christ. Gold was for a king, frankincense was for a priest, and myrrh, curiously, was for one who was to one day be buried and needed to be anointed. You see, in Jesus Christ, the wise men not only encountered grace for cause of some ascension to a theological truth, but they saw in Jesus one who was sent by God so that we could know God and in that ourselves experience a joy unparalyzed because like the wise men, you and I, are in joy because we too have received grace. Here's a truth that I want all of us to get our hearts and heads around. Grace is not something that you receive just because you've been bad. Grace is not something meted out by God just so that a saint can become a once again, born again believer. But grace is in fact given by God because God is good, amen? And in God's goodness, he likewise wants to manifest grace to all of us. Not just because Christ is king and priest and resurrected savior, but because in this Christmas season, you likewise can encounter grace. I've seen it in my own personal life. Every time I receive a daughter's hug, I encounter the grace of God. 
Every time a wife who loves me looks at me and says, I know it's been a hard day, but remember you do this because you've been called, not because you're qualified. (laughs) Yes, grace is a mysterious thing. It's in seeing our children here, representing the gospel story. It was entitled, And the Stars Sang, and I believe through their little hearts and minds, it did. I, along with over 130 others, encountered the grace of God. It's in going to a football stadium last night and cheering on a team with young men and coaches that I've grown to love, and even in defeat, celebrating all the good that happened in that moment and in the many moments leading up unto it. It's being able to love you all. It's being loved by you all. All of these ways, grace manifests itself to me, and I believe likewise it's manifesting itself to you. The question is whether or not you are going to awaken. Like that scripture from Isaiah, many of us are like those who are walking in the darkness, but it's time to see a great light. It's not just a star from heaven, but it is the light of Jesus Christ waiting to break through into your heart and to remind you once again, not only had you received grace for forgiveness of sins, but you received grace over and over again simply because God loves you. Do you hear me? God loves you. Period. No parentheses or exception or footnote. It's there in the person of Jesus Christ. And the question before all of us, this Christmas journey, is will we fully receive that grace? And when we do, my friends, allow me to assure you that the joy that you so much long to experience will be yours. So here's a little homework assignment for you this week. Yes, all of you, even the teachers who are giving out the homework assignments this time of year, it's to take time to inventory all of the ways in which God's grace is manifested to you. Your family, your friends, your work, your life. I want you to make an attempt to create an exhaustive list. And then in praise to God, in the spirit of the wise men, I want you to open your hearts and minds to having been received in the presence. And even though you give gifts, you walk away thinking, but I received a greater gift still. And as I return to my places of influence, wherever they might be, I know that it is a gift which everyone desires to receive similarly. Will you do that for me? Nod your head in affirmation if it's true. Let's be a people who seek the light of the world. Let's be a people that celebrate grace because God is good and let's be a people of joy. Would you pray? Our Father in heaven, as we turn to a moment of decision, we likewise turn our hearts to the source of joy. He is also the source of our grace, a grace that is renewed every single day in our journey with you. Let us capture every single way in which you speak your love to us. Let us celebrate it in every way we can, always in joy. Amen.